currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's live edition. It is January 25th, 2013. And tonight I am joined by a special guest, someone who uh, I've referred to on the broadcast before. I've talked about uh, a case that he witnessed, and we're going to be getting into it. And I also. Uh, talked and plugged him when he was running for Congress last year uh, during 2012. Unfortunately, he uh, didn't win, but he did have a, a rather interesting learning experience, which we'll get into uh, later on. But uh, without further ado, I don't want to waste any more time because there's a ton of stuff to go over. I want to introduce to the audience my guest tonight, Mr. Kurt Haskell. Kurt, welcome to the broadcast. Glad to be on the show. Man, uh there's so much I want to pick your brain about. We were chatting off air, uh, and uh, I, I want to get into the, the run for Congress and stuff. But first, let's uh, uh, let's go over the, the obvious that most people are going to ask about, which and we can spend as much time as we have to on it, which is the, the underwear bomber case. But first, take a few minutes and go ahead and introduce yourself to the listeners. Let them uh, get to know you for a second. Sure. Well, I'm an attorney in Michigan. I have my own law firm that I run with with my wife, we're law partners. Um, and like you mentioned, I ran for Congress last year, and, and I came pretty close to winning. I won the primary. I lost the general election by 10%. And, uh, but what I'm mostly well-known for is being an eyewitness in the underwear bomber case. I was on the plane with the underwear bomber. I sat eight rows behind him. And, you know, I, I witnessed him before boarding and, uh, I'm no, I know we're going to get into a lot of detail about it, but, uh, you know, I'm one of the few living eyewitnesses to a false flag event that I, you know, that I feel is a provable false flag event. So that, that's what I'm mostly well known for. And you were already awake to the beyond looking beyond the left right paradigm and the the ideas of a false flag event and how governments could use them to push a political agenda uh and the and the such before this event happened correct no not really no not at all oh this really event, this was your eye-opening experience yeah this event completely transformed my life and how i see things and what i believe and what i don't believe and i to me I look at things with a totally different set of eyes now than I did then. I, I look at my life in two compartments prior to Christmas Day 2009 and after Christmas Day 2009. That much of a difference. 
Wow. Wow. It's like pre-9-11 and post-9-11. All right, well, let's get right into it then. It's Christmas Day, 2009, and what do you see? What's going on? Tell us, where do you start off? Sure. Well, my wife and I were on vacation. We were in Africa. We were in Uganda, actually, on a safari. Coming back, we uh, we had a connecting flight through Kenya and then uh, Amsterdam and then back home to Detroit. Um, we live outside Detroit. And um, what our flight back from Amsterdam to Detroit, flight 253, is the infamous underwater bomber flight or that what it's been called since then but the story begins in amsterdam you know my wife and i were waiting for a flight we're sitting by the gate playing cards on the floor and you know i was just people watching like i do sometimes like most people do and i saw an african kid he looked like he was about 16 or so to me dressed in jeans and a white t-shirt which was odd because it was christmas day it was cold he, and everybody else had on heavy clothes and winter jackets and he was walking with what looked like a wealthy uh, he looked to me like he was from india uh, he looked indian to me uh older guy well somewhat older guy maybe around 50 and this kid looked like 16 so it's a weird couple indian guy had on a suit and they're walking together, and I'm just wondering why they're traveling together. They went up to the counter, and the Indian man, he was the only one that, that said anything. He said, this guy needs to get on the flight, but he doesn't have a passport. And the girl behind the desk said, well, you can't get on the flight without a passport. And then the Indian guy kind of argued with her and, and said, uh, he's from Sudan. We do this all the time. And she then, after a few seconds, I think she made a call, uh, referred them down a the hallway and said, well, you're going to have to go talk to a manager. And they went down this secure hallway where nobody else was allowed. And that's when I quit watching. They were unescorted. And uh, I didn't think much of it. I didn't even tell my wife about it. You know, I was just thinking, well, you know, this guy will be in Amsterdam and I'll be in Detroit here in a few hours. He won't get on the flight. But... Um, that wasn't the case. About eight hours later, we're coming in to land in Detroit, and uh, he tries to blow up our plane, or so we're told. And uh, it was a pre- it was a pretty uneventful flight. And I didn't even notice the guy, you know, before this event took place. But um, what happened was a, a flight attendant walked by my seat and was mumbling to herself and she said something smells like smoke and that got me to look up and i could see you know some rows up on the left hand side my wife and i were on the right hand side of the plane uh there was smoke coming up and there was a bit of a disturbance and i i ran up the aisle on the right side to get a better look and uh the entire area over there burst into flames and uh, one man put a headlock around another guy and hauled him off into the first class area. But it, it was kind of strange because nobody was yelling. It wasn't like a fight. They weren't yelling at each other. There was no um, this line. Nothing so like it wasn't that. like you would think. It, it was more. It was more subdued than you would think. Yeah, it was like you. You know, you would expect. Punches thrown, choking. It was more like he runs up, grabs the guy around the neck, and walks into the first class area, which in itself is weird to me, but it was very, it was strange. But I, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to that. My, more, my bigger concern was our plane's on fire, the floor is on fire, two seats are burning, and the flames are up the wall, it's starting to burn the ceiling, and our plane's going to go down in flames. That was my concern. That's what I was paying more attention to. But you guys were still in the air at the time, right? Oh, yeah. We were at uh, 20,000 feet. So, yeah, we were quite a ways up still. Wow. And and did anybody start to panic at all? Oh, very much. Uh, People were screaming, fire, fire. We need water over here to put this fire out, you know, help, Um, those kind of things. The pilot came on the loudspeaker and and said, emergency landing. And you could feel our plane then speed up instead of slowing down, going and landing. We sped up. And uh, it was pretty frightening, actually. The entire, after the fire was put out, it had to be put out with a fire extinguisher. 
everybody became real silent. It was very eerie. There wasn't a peep on the plane for the next 10 minutes until we landed. Oh, uh, you were, they got you down that fast? 10 minutes, yeah. Wow. 10 minutes is what it took. And, and, you know, and then the next interesting thing happened. You know, here I am witnessing something happen on a plane. I wasn't exactly sure what at this point, but... Um, you know, I'm expecting our plane to land. The emergency doors will open. The chutes will open. We'll jump out and slide down the chutes. But that's not what happened. We taxied up to the gate, just like normal flight would. Um, police rush onto our plane. They only go into the first class area, though. None of them check what's going on in the rest of the plane. They don't check any carry-on bags. don't check for any accomplices. They don't. Um, block off the area where the disturbance took place, even though there's powder everywhere, you know, um, pieces of a device laying around. Uh, very strange. And, you know, we sit on the plane for 20 or 30 minutes. We don't know if we're safe or not, or the plane's going to blow up at any second. And nobody seems to care. Uh, after 20 or 30 minutes, the, um, a man is escorted off the plane in handcuffs and that he stood in the doorway of the plane before he exited for about 20, 30 seconds. And that's when I got a good look at him. And I realized it was the same guy I saw in Amsterdam, the same African kid. And I turned to my wife and I said, Holy cow. I think I saw something important in Amsterdam. And then I told her the story and she said, well, we need to tell the police. You know, and, and we did the first chance we got, which was about six hours later. But before that happened, um, he was taken off the plane. As he was exiting the plane, he said, there's another accomplice and there's a bomb on the plane. Yet, we're all escorted off with all our carry-on bags. None of them checked by anybody else. We're taken into the terminal and we're all put along a wall that, of a floor that had been evacuated. So only passengers from our plane could be there. And we stood there for a long time. We weren't allowed to use the bathroom, use our phones, drink anything, nothing. And uh, the police brought in bomb sniffing dogs. And they went around to each passenger, sniffed their bags. And one of them sniffed something in, an, in a carry-on bag of another Indian man. This one much younger, maybe around age 30. And this man was taken for questioning in, in a room off to the side. He wasn't handcuffed at that point, but he was in there about an hour for questioning. Then he was brought out. And when he was brought out, he was then handcuffed and taken away. As he was being taken away, one of the officers came up to the rest of us passengers and said, you, you're being moved out of this area now. It's not safe here. I'm sure you witnessed what just happened. Um, so we're now going to take you out of this room into another room. We're all escorted out of this room into a hallway, and we stand there for a few more hours. Um, after about five hours pass, the the person I consider to be the lead investigator comes up and makes an announcement and he says, we believe we have those responsible for this in custody. Those plural, not the man, not him, not the terrorist, those. He then says, we're going to do an interview with each of you with an FBI agent and then you'll be free to go. And then we're escorted back into the room we started in. We're all, interviewed by the FBI and that's when I first tell them the story about what I witnessed and they initially seemed interested the agent I was telling it to telling the story to called over another agent and they both started taking notes and, and they said we'll be in touch um, and you know I, I was thinking hey I'm doing my patriotic duty here I'm trying to help help catch an accomplice to a terrorist attack who should be probably one of the 10 most wanted men in the world. And, you know, I'll, ha I'll help catch him. You know, I, I knew nothing different at this point. Um, my opinion would soon change though, because over the next few days, 
the lies started coming out of the government. And the first one was there was no second man arrested. There was only one man involved. And I knew that wasn't true because not only myself, but over 200 other passengers were there when the second man was arrested when a dog sniffed an explosive in his bag. And I knew that wasn't true. It was a lie. And uh, several passengers spoke to people in the media and backed me up and said, Kurt's right. There was another guy arrested. And the government, this was the first time the government changed its story as to this man. Who's referred to to as the man in orange in the media because he had on an orange shirt. Um, the government changed its story on this man uh, four more times. You know, they, the stories included he wasn't part of our plane. And like I said, this, the entire floor was evacuated before we got there. So he for sure was from our plane because we were the only ones allowed on this floor. We were sequestered so much that Passengers from other planes weren't even allowed to be bored while we were down there. They were sitting on the runway on their planes for hours. So I knew that story wasn't true. And then I, I said that to a member of the media, and then the government changed its story again, saying, yeah, there was um, a man arrested, but it was on an immigration violation. And I said, well, that's not possible either. These were bomb-sniffing dogs. They sniffed an explosive. A anyway, the, the story changed five times. And I started wondering what was going on, why the government was being dishonest. And then the government came out and said, um, well, for, well, first of all, they came to my law office three days later to do another interview of me. And uh, the first thing I asked, two FBI agents, two different ones came by. And the first thing I asked them was, well, did you bring the airport video or a still picture so I can help you identify the uh, what's known as the sharp dress man, the man in the suit in Amsterdam that I witnessed. And not only did the witnesses not bring a picture or video of him, when I asked the question, the two FBI agents looked at each other and just kind of shrugged their shoulders and did like a chuckle under their breath. And I thought that was very weird, especially being an attorney. I know how these things work. You show an eyewitness a picture to help in the investigation, to make sure you're looking for the right person. But they didn't do that. Uh, they did show me a series of other pictures, of, you know, maybe seven pictures or so, people I had no idea who they were. And the last two pictures that I was shown were of the terrorist, the underwear bomber himself. And first of all, the... The FBI didn't need to show those pictures to me to have me identify him. There were over 200 other people on our flight that could have identified him. There was a change of custody from his arrest, um, you know, all the way through his prison cell. And uh, they showed me two pictures of him. And the questions that were asked were, in my opinion, trying to confuse me to make me think I didn't see what I did which I thought was interesting, too. In I was going to say, that's what it sounds like they were trying to do by yeah. showing you the multiple pictures, if, especially if you've, looked, if you've ever looked into, um, like, for instance, Bobby Kennedy's assassination. There was a witness that uh, saw some, uh, a, a, guy, a young guy and a, a female run out of the back of a, uh, uh, run away from, you know, out the back entrance there and saying something like, we shot, you know, we just shot uh, Kennedy. And when she was uh, questioned by the police... And other authorities later on, they did the same thing. They brought in multiple different dresses to confuse her, uh, and then they badgered her. Did they? Did they feel, or did they come across to you? Did you feel threatened in, uh, or um, maybe not threatened, but um, you know that that foreboding uh, essence or energy that they could give off, like kind of like, hmm, what do you know? Kind of trying to find out get a feel for what you know and maybe letting you know that they're keeping an eye on you. You know how they do that. Did you get that feeling from that visit at all or no? No, I can't say that I did. The, the feeling I got was that they're trying to bring confusion into my mind to make me think I didn't see what I did. That, that's the impression I got and that they had no intention of investigating the second man at all. So that, that's the impression I got. You know, I, I'm not stupid. I'm an attorney. I've, worked in a lot of criminal cases, a lot of cases, you know, where there's 
evidence involved. And I know how these things are handled. I'm not stupid. And I'm sure they figured that out. Um, but yet they still tried to confuse me. It didn't work, but they did try. So now I, I was starting to get really suspicious with what's going on. And the next thing that happened was the government came out and made a statement to the press saying, uh, we've reviewed 400 hours of security camera footage from Amsterdam from the airport, and there's no accomplice on the video. And I knew that was a lie, too. And I knew that because the Amsterdam airport has more security cameras than every airport in the world, specifically at the gate. They have cameras at each gate in this conversation took place very near the gate. So I knew uh, that that was also a lie. So now I'm really wondering what's going on. Um, and I started doing my own investigation. I started talking to passengers. I started going to the hearings, reading everything I could um, about this, watching all the, the shows on TV about it. It was a big, quite a big deal. And um, slowly, over two years, I finally figured out what happened. But it took a lot of effort on my part. I put about 2,000 hours of my own time investigating this matter, piece by piece by piece. So all the pieces of the puzzle, or nearly all of them, were put into place. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle came to me about a month later when there were hearings on this in Congress. And it was interesting because during the hearings, Patrick Kennedy, who works at the State Department, admitted that the government knew uh, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, I always call him Umar, the underwear bomber himself, they admitted they knew he was a terrorist. Not only that, they knew, um, or they admitted that they were tracking him and that they wanted to let him into the United States so that, quote, we could follow him and he would lead us to bigger fish. So it was an admission that the United States government let him into the United States on purpose. Although, wow, the real purpose was much different than what was admitted. Of course, it, it usually is. I'm going to cut us off right there, Kurt, because we got a break sneaking up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. we got another hour and a half of my guest. You don't want to miss the rest of this information. It's first-hand account. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Tonight, I'm joined by Kurt Haskell, who was a witness to the underwear bomber, the quote-unquote underwear bomber, the terrorist, the mastermind. Right, well, we'll get into that. But there's more to Kurt than that, so stay tuned, because coming up, later on in the broadcast, we're going to get into his <coughs> run. And ladies and gentlemen, you know, he didn't win in his run for Congress, but... I guarantee you, he it, it was a uh, an epic learning experience to say the least for him. And uh, unfortunately, you know, in order to win, it doesn't matter if you have the, the the popular vote or not. It's really about who's got the the bigger wallet. But he did the right thing, and this all stemmed from him witnessing this event. And actually, I didn't even know that myself, Kurt. I had thought that you were kind of awake when this happened, and that's why you had noticed it. I didn't even realize that that was your your catalyzing event into your awakening that you've now had was the the underwear bomber event. So uh, that that that's interesting. I, I didn't even realize that myself. Uh, getting back into where we left off when the break came up, you were talking about Patrick Kennedy, and he had he had actually admitted that yeah they had let him in, although they said it was for a different reason than what they act and you know what you had put together through your two-year investigation and what the evidence points to why they let him in. It's two different stories. Yeah, this was still very early on, you know, or maybe a month into this. And like I said, the, I was shocked because the government was admitting um, that, in fact, this was not a mistake that he was on our plane. It was an intentional act, although they try and skirt around it and use different words and try and confuse. You can actually watch Patrick Kennedy's video on YouTube of his, of his testimony. Um, make sure you watch the first one, though, because he was brought back a week later to kind of clarify, you know, uh, what he said a week earlier. But what you can clearly make out from that hearing is that uh, the government knew 
Umar was a terrorist, let him on our plane intentionally, and the government admits they wanted to follow him after he got to the U.S. to lead them to bigger fish. Sounds plausible, except he had a bomb that was defective. Now, we'll get into that in a minute, but around the time he was giving this testimony, and, you know, I became friends with many people in the media over this, and some of them would confide in me information that they knew that wasn't released to the public. And one of the friends I made in the media called me around the time of this testimony and said, you know, Kurt, when your flight landed in Detroit, there were 50 FBI agents at the gate ready to question Umar. Think about that for a minute. And you have to remember this attack took place 10 minutes before we landed. And it was noon on Christmas Day at an airport that's 30 miles outside of Detroit. How'd they get there so fast? How did they get there? But number two, well, and why were they there? But number two, if we're to believe the government's story that the government wanted to follow Umar after he landed in Detroit to lead, uh, to have him lead to bigger fish, well, then you don't have 50 FBI agents at the gate ready to question him. So that story Patrick Kennedy told for the reason was also a lie. Um, so again, more red flags going up with me. I, I hadn't put all the pieces yet together, what really happened. And at this point I was questioning whether my government actually put a terrorist with a live bomb on my plane in an effort to blow it up. And I didn't want to think that, but at this point I didn't know. And I had many, many sleepless nights over it. Um, the next thing that happened was ABC News came out with an article. Uh, and in this article, it said, and the title of the article is Female Suicide Bombers May Be Heading to the U.S. from Yemen. You can probably Google it and still read it. But at the bottom of this article, it doesn't, doesn't seem like this article is related to the underwear bombing. But it is because buried at the bottom of this article, it says, um, the federal government initially didn't believe that there was an accomplice in the underwear bombing attack. And now that position has changed and the government now believes that there was an Al Qaeda member there who was there to make sure the underwear bomber did not get cold feet in Amsterdam. Obviously this admission, first of all, I was very happy that there was an admission by the government of the second man. So this was more vindication to me. But you can see how the government uses part truth and part lie to confuse and try and push their fraudulent uh, story. And the lie was that there was an Al-Qaeda member there to make sure he didn't get cold feet. Remember what I witnessed in Amsterdam? This man was an authority figure, went to the gate, who said he needs to board the plane. We do this all the time. Now, if you're Al-Qaeda, you're not going up to an airline worker and saying, we do this all the time. You're also not allowed to escort someone down a secure hallway by yourself. This was some man in pow a power position and probably not coincidentally spoke perfect American English without an accent, even though we we're in Europe. So, again, you can see part truth, part lie meant to confuse. So also, as this case went on, I got to see all the tools the government uses to perpetrate false events, uh, you know, right before my eyes, just like this. So I got to see how these things sort of play out. So subsequent events like this that have happened later, I have a much more keen eye on and I can see what tools are being used by the government in those events and see what is actually truthful or not. But anyway, have you spoken uh, to any of the other uh, witnesses? Um, yeah, the, the issue, though, is the main part of what I witnessed at the Amsterdam airport, there was only one other person that saw it. See, at, at gate E7, which is the gate we're at, there's a very large room, and it's connected to a very small room, uh, the boarding area. And Lori and I, my wife Lori and I, were sitting in the small room, and there were only maybe 15 people in this room out of nearly 300 that were on our flight. Everybody else was in the large room. So... You know, would it, uh, only a handful of people even would have been able to witness and hear what I did. And only one person contacted me and said, Kurt, I saw what you did. You're right. But 
you know, I see what the media is trying to do to you. And the, the media is trying to discredit me big time, and the government was too. And she said, frankly, I'm scared. You know, please don't give anyone my name, but I just wanted to let you know I saw what you did. So I, have, I haven't told anyone who she is, and she hasn't come out publicly ever about it, but there was one other witness. So um, then, you know, I, again, by this point, I'm really wondering what's going on. So I started going to all the court hearings. You know, and a, a lot of the court hearings, Lori and I, or maybe just myself, were the only passengers there. And very early on, Umar was given, uh, you know, a court-appointed attorney, and he fired the court-appointed attorney. And I went to a hearing, and I saw Anthony Chambers was there. Anthony Chambers was appointed by the judge as... Um, kind of a helper attorney. He wasn't the actual attorney, but he was there to help with paperwork and answer questions. Boomer called it a standby attorney. And Anthony Chambers, uh, I got the impression that he didn't know a lot of the details of the case during the hearing. And at this hearing, the government requested that Anthony Chambers not be given any of the evidence in the case. And what, what the government attorney said was, uh, Anthony Chambers is not the attorney in this case. He's only a standby attorney. Therefore, he doesn't have attorney-client privilege, and there's no confidential confidentiality as to any evidence that he sees. Passengers can subpoena the information and use it to sue the United States government. And here I am sitting in the courtroom when the statement was made, and I'm wondering, why is the U.S. government concerned about being sued in this case when it's simply a terrorist attack by, you know, uh, by a foreigner? Uh, also, you know, I got the impression that there wasn't a lot of communication between Umar and Anthony Chambers. So shortly thereafter, I sent uh, Anthony Chambers a fax. And I said, here's who I am. Here's what I saw. Um, let me know if I can be of any assistance. Here's my number. And he called me within, within a half an hour of him getting that fax, and he said, we need to talk immediately. And uh, we set up a meeting in his office, and I went up there, and we talked for a few hours, maybe like three hours, about the case. And I said, look, do you think I'm some kind of crazy person? Um, you know, what do you think of the story I'm telling you? And he said, we believe you 100%. We've been thinking something like this is going on, but we haven't been able to pinpoint it because, frankly, Umar doesn't tell us a whole lot. And I said, uh, well, let me know if I can be any of assistance. Um, you know, uh, I'll be in touch, you know, because I just want, I just want the truth of this to come out. You know, I don't necessarily want to testify on behalf of the man that tried to kill me. Maybe, you know, it might have been the first time in the history of the United States that that happened. But I, you know, I, I, frankly, I was tired of the government lying about it. And I just wanted the truth to come out in the court here. And so that's why I offered my services. And I went one step further than that. Uh, as Anthony Chambers was only a standby attorney, and I'm an attorney in Michigan too, I attempted to talk to Umar in prison. And to see if I could help because to me, Umar was being railroaded uh, and being set up as a patsy. And I called the prison about five times trying to set up an appointment with him. Nobody would call me back. So one day uh, I, I told one of the attorneys in my office, let's take a drive out to Milan prison. We're going to try and talk to Umar since nobody will return my calls. And we did. We drove out there. We talked to uh, the security guard at the front desk and said, hey, we're attorneys. We understand Umar has no attorney at this time. We'd like to talk to him about giving him some pro bono legal advice. And he said, well, let me have your IDs. We should be able to set that up now. Just hang out a few minutes and you'll be able to talk to him. We just need to clear it with the manager of the wing that he's in. She's in a meeting. The meeting will be done in about five minutes. And he said, great. And uh, we could see him behind a glass wall, and the manager of the wing came out, was talking to him, and he gave her our IDs, and she looked 
at my ID and she started shaking her head no. And he came out and told us, well, uh, you can't talk to him now. You're going to have to go call and set that up. And uh, we went back to our law office. I called. And then I was told, well, Umar can never have visitors unless he lists you on his um, guest guest um, list before you come in, which totally violates his right to an attorney, in my opinion, um, who's denied, you know, chance to have legal advice in the case. But that's what happened. So he was clearly being walled off from anyone being able to talk to him. Um, so I kept going to more hearings and, um, talking to Anthony Chambers and talking to more people on our flight. And as time went on, I I read in the the paper here in Detroit, um, a very interesting story where Anthony Chambers was interviewed. And in this interview, what he said was, uh, the government has hired explosive explosives experts to testify in the case, and the experts all indicate that the bomb was impossibly defective because it lacked a detonator, which I thought was very interesting. These were people paid by the United States government to testify in the case, and they were going to be testifying that the bomb could not have exploded. So then you have to ask, do I really believe the government story, which is, uh, you know, Umar t- took all this trouble. He flew to Yemen to have this bomb stitch into his underwear in Yemen, went back to Nigeria, flew from Nigeria to Amsterdam to Detroit, all with a bomb that lasted that nader. And you have to wonder whether Al-Qaeda would have gone to such trouble to stage a terrorist attack with a defective bomb? And to me, the answer is clearly no. There's a different answer going on there. And about the same time, we had the Portland Christmas tree bomber, Mohammed Muhammad, uh, and that ca- in that case, the government admitted to supplying him with an intentionally defective bomb. And they did the same with the Wrigley Field bomber about the same time. Uh, although the, the press kind of hushed up both accounts, uh, it's on record that the government admitted to giving both of them defective bombs. And at this time, I finally came to the conclusion that this was actually a staged terrorist attack, uh, that he was actually given a defective bomb, put on the plane intentionally to light a defective bomb, knowing that it would cause a fire, but because it lacked a detonator, it would not explode, and therefore there would be a disturbance on a plane, no explosion, and everyone would be able to tell that the bomb was, in fact, in his underwear, as there would be no explosion. And therefore, body scanning machines would be needed in each airport to try and find potential bombs in people's underwear. Obviously, if it was uh, uh, an explosive bomb, the plane would have detonated. There would be no evidence of where the bomb would have been at. So, you know, it took me a lot of time to start putting these pieces together. Well, you know, it's one thing, this is something I learned when I was taking uh, courses and, and training to be an, uh, an arson investigator when I was uh, much younger, when I was a, a firefighter. The one thing that I learned is if you, uh, like when we would, inv- if you'd investigate an arson, a lot of the times uh, it would be a firefighter, right? And one of the key things that gave it away that it would be a firefighter was if the fire was set, a lot of times there was care taken so that way the responding firefighters or surrounding people wouldn't get hurt by the fire and it's like well who would take care so that firefighters wouldn't get hurt and people wouldn't get hurt if it's just some regular fire bug so then you know what i mean you know where to look in this instance it's the same kind of thing uh you know who would what kind of terrorist would take care and not want to kill innocent people you know what i mean if by definition if you're a terrorist you don't really care you're trying to kill innocent people so right. to go out of your way and, you know, we're going to set this whole thing up, but we're going to put an inert bomb in there to back up the United States' insane police state. Uh, huh? It- right. It's, cr- it's crazy. But if you look at all the pieces, and there are so many pieces to this, there's really no other logical conclusion you can make. 
it's really crazy. Um, why, why did he light his bomb in his seat instead of in the bathroom where no one would have bothered him? There's no answer for that. Uh, you know, and I haven't even gone to mentioning that this, this entire event was filmed by a passenger with a camcorder from before it started until after it ended. Uh, you know, there are so many questions uh, that all lead to the same conclusion that this, in fact, was a staged event. Um, but anyway, back to uh, one other thing was really curious to right, I'm going to go back in time a little. Right after this happened, one of the other passengers um, called me and he said, you know, Kurt, you didn't see what you did at the Amsterdam airport. And I said, what do you mean? I didn't see it. Yeah, I did. He said, no, what you saw was uh, a minor child who was traveling without his parent and he was being escorted by someone from the airline. And I said, no, this guy, this guy was like 16 years old or older. And he said, no, he was a minor. I saw him after we landed in Detroit. You didn't really see what you're saying. I don't want you to be embarrassed when the truth comes out in the media. I think you should quit talking about it. And I said, that's not what I saw, but okay, you know, that's your opinion. And I, I started looking into it a little more, and I found out that this guy that called me worked for a contractor of the Department of Defense. And the, I checked with the airline. The airline admitted there were no um, unescorted minors traveling. And, in fact, you have to be under the age of 12 to even get an escort uh, from the airline. And he looked much older than 12. So, um the same man was interviewed by the Detroit Free Press here in Michigan, and he had a rather curious comment. Only a week after the flight, he said, I think Americans should completely forget about this event and focus on jobs and the economy. Now, what kind of statement is that to a victim of a terrorist attack a week before? Very, very curious statement. Um, and uh, with that, Someone, again, one of my friends in the media told me, you know, Kurt, we looked at into who were passengers on the train, and nearly all of the people were government workers, military or retired military or government workers. And I thought that was pretty interesting, too. Um, so back to, back to where we were in the court case. Uh, I went to another hearing, and... This hearing was scheduled by Anthony Chambers, and he asked for a delay in the trial. And this was um, July of 2011. The trial was scheduled for uh, no, October 2011. So it was about four months away, and what he said was, the government has just given me key evidence in this case, the best evidence I have for the defense and, you know, I've been given it very late in the trial. Remember, this event happened in Christmas Day 09, so about a year and a half into this. He said, I need to, more time to analyze, and I need to hire some experts to testify on behalf uh, of Umar due to this evidence. And he listed out what the evidence was. And it was real interesting to me because it all tied into what my theory was on the case. And he said, I've just been given a copy of Umar's passport. And to me, I'm thinking, well, why did it take a year and a half to turn the guy's passport over unless, of course, you had to create one? Um, I've been given some of the airport security video. I've been given um, an interview of the uh, interview transcript of one of the, uh, I don't know what you call him, but the person that does the airline security interview in Europe, we don't have those people here, but they ask you a few questions. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. That's the the, the the person at the gate that like asks you how your trip was and all that. Right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut us off right there, Kurt, and I'll, we can pick it up in the beginning of hour two because the the top of the hour break is sneaking up on us. Time just flies right by here on my broadcast. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. Hour one up, hour two coming up. You don't want to miss the rest of this. Another hour, my guest Kurt Haskell. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. And tonight I am joined 
by Kurt Haskell. Kurt witnessed the underwear bomber and the fiasco and the ensuing cover-up. And as you heard in hour one, that was actually his awakening point that he started to look at things differently. And if you didn't hear hour one, I suggest you go back in the archives and uh, listen to it because uh, it'll blow your mind and it'll definitely blow away anything that you've heard from the government uh, on the official, I'm doing air quotes, the official story of the underwear bomber. And now it's wrapped up with a nice little bow because I believe he pled guilty. Right, Kurt? Didn't he just plead guilty? Yeah, yeah, he did. But Ni- we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Nice That's little a red bow. Whole other story. Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Kurt pick up right where uh, we got cut off because there's just so much information, and I I, I don't want to you know I, I don't want to take any I don't want to take up too much time. I want to give you as much time as you need uh, and donate it to this topic. So go right ahead. The floor is yours. Sure. Well, we were talking about Anthony Chambers getting the most important evidence in the case, or so he described it. But if you're not an attorney, you don't understand the significance of that. But a tactic of attorneys to play dirty is to withhold important evidence to just before a trial and then turn it over so that the other attorney doesn't have much time to look at it and or hire experts to look at it to come testify. And that's what happened here. Uh, this evidence was held about a year and a half. And strangely, all of it pointed to my theory on the case at the time, which is still my theory, that... Uh, Umar was given a defective bomb by undercover government agents and allowed on the plane intentionally to perpetrate a false terrorist attack. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting when I heard Chambers describing the important evidence that he received so late in the case. But uh, Judge Edmund said, no, it, we're not going to delay the trial. We're going to have it starting in October. So um, I went back for jury selection. Well, actually, just before jury selection, um, there was one more hearing, and at this hearing, Judge Edmonds asked Umar, Umar, who are you going to call as witnesses in this case? And Umar said, I'm only going to call one witness, attorney Kurt Haskell, me, which I, w- I was kind of shocked at because, uh, you know, I was talking to Anthony Chambers, but Anthony Chambers was only the standby attorney. He had no authority to uh, bring any witnesses in. So I was kind of shocked when Umar himself said that I would be his witness because I had never talked to Umar, ever. Um, but apparently Anthony Chambers was talking to Umar about me and showing him faxes that I sent, letters that I sent, and that sort of thing. So not only was I going to be the star witness for the defense, I was going to be the only witness for the defense in a murder, uh, an attempted murder trial when I was one of the murder victims. Very strange. But um, before the trial happened, this was four days, I believe, Four days before the trial, jury selection started, and uh, I went to the jury selection interviews. At, at these interviews, both attorneys as well as the judge gets to ask potential jurors questions, and two of the same questions kept coming up over and over again. And those would be, uh, do you realize that sometimes the media lies, and was number one, and number two, do you think you'll be able to tell after you hear the evidence whether Umar actually possessed a bomb? Which I thought was interesting, too, because it went along with my theory of the case that he was giving a defective bomb, but it, a bomb that cannot explode is not really a bomb. So, you know, and uh, as well as the media covering up what was really going on. So both of those questions that kept being asked of nearly every juror, again, both tied in with what I believe is going on in the case. So the trial starts. The first request by the prosecution in the trial, and of course I'm in the courtroom, is uh, a request by the prosecutors to kick me uh, out of the courtroom until I was going to testify, which is normal. Um, But they also asked that my wife be kicked out. Um, And Judge Edmonds said, Kurt has to leave. He's kicked out, but Lori can stay, but she cannot talk to Kurt about any of the proceedings until the trial ends, which was going to be over a month later. So I thought, I thought that was going to be a very interesting month or so in my household. But um, two hours into the trial, and I need to mention one other thing before I say this. During one of my conversations with Anthony Chambers, the standby attorney, he told me that Umar was offered very lenient plea deals from the government. And to quote Anthony Chambers, the government just wants this case to go away. 
Um, so now we proceed to the trial. Two hours into the trial, Umar pleads guilty to all of the charges which require a mandatory life sentence with no chance of parole. So he pleads to a deal, if you can call it a deal, that he'll never get out of prison, which if you're an attorney, never, ever, ever happens for any reason. You know, if you take a plea, there's some lenient sentence, chance you get out of prison, you plead to some of the charges and other ones are dropped, something like that. So I knew that wasn't a legitimate plea at that time. Judge Edmund sets sentencing out for a couple months later. Um, in the meantime, um, all victims in Michigan are allowed to make what's called a victim impact statement. So you get to go to sentencing, you get to say how the case has affected you, et cetera, et cetera. The, the judge is supposed to take that into consideration in the sentencing. Um, usually you're given an unlimited amount of time and all of us passengers had to send in a letter saying whether or not we wanted to give a victim impact statement. Well, only five passengers out of 289 sent those in and there were five of us and usually you're given an unlimited amount of time, but Judge Edmund said, no, you're only going to be given five minutes each to give your victim impact statement. Obviously, knowing who I was, that I had sent a request in, and knowing everything I had said in the media to this point. So I made a very, very carefully worded statement, um, timed it, I read it again and again and again because I didn't want to go um, off of what I, what exactly I wanted to say. Remember, I'm an attorney and I practice in this court building every week. I'm there doing hearings and I could be disbarred, you know, if I say the wrong thing or sent to jail or fine, that kind of thing. Um, and you can read my victim impact statement on the internet if you just Google my name, victim impact statement. But in this statement, I basically ripped the government and the media for lying to everyone perpetrating a hoax on the American public. Uh, and despite the courtroom being packed with people from the media all over the country, all the biggest media outlets and newspapers, none of them reported on what I had to say. Um, many of them even completely ignored the fact that I said anything at all or that I was even there, which is very telling, um, which is not what I thought would have happened before this case, before I became involved in this case. I thought the media actually did in, in-depth interviews and this sort of thing, but Clearly, that's not what happened. Um, so we had Umar being sentenced to life without parole. And, you know, I, I ran into Anthony Chambers. We became friends after this, and we're both attorneys. So I run into him in court now and then. And a few months after this, I ran into him, and I said, look, Anthony, off the record, uh, you and I both know that was not a legitimate plea deal. I only see three possibilities why he gave this or took this plea and i said he's either uh threatened or i'm sorry he's either promised something threatened or he was tortured and anthony chambers said i agree um but it was not number one meaning he was not promised anything you know, he was either uh threatened or tortured according to anthony chambers so we both agree that it was not a legitimate plea but uh, that's how the case ended. So really that's about all I have to say. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of other smaller details about the case, but there's so much to it. It's hard to always remember all of it. Isn't it nice how they tied it up with a nice little red bow? Yeah, conveniently, uh, you know, it happened before I was able to testify in the case. So obviously, so obviously they were afraid of what you had to say and what you were going to say on the stand. Without question, and Anthony Chambers told me that too. He and it would have been in the re it would have been in the record, right? So there, therefore, it would have been forever written down, uh, you know, somewhere logged away that this is, you know, slammed at least in a court of law on record that you said this at, at the very least as testimony. Not only that, but me being the only witness for the defense, it would have been impossible for the media to not report on. It would have had to have been reported in every newspaper in, in the country. Can you, sure. imagine, 
Can you imagine if they had not reported on a Kurt? If they had, if you had gone, can you imagine if you had gone up there, gotten your chance to say whatever you had said, including lambasting the the, the media for you know their their, <laughs> their garbage? Can you imagine if they then turned their backs and didn't report on that, and the only people that reported on it were perhaps the local press and the alternative media? I mean, that would have created a a huge firestorm. So they would have been damned if at that point they would have been damned if they did and damned if they didn't. So they had to just. Whoosh, cut it off right the other you know the i was actually concerned for my own safety at that point no knowing i was on the witness list and i was actually when i got a a call that the case had ended in a settlement i was actually on the internet looking to hire a bodyguard at that time because i was very concerned for my own safety you know just so happens that witnesses in these cases end up dead sometimes before they can testify so i i was actually very concerned Wow, and have you has that concern has that concern subsided slightly at all, or do you still fear for your safety at that? No, a- you know I don't really think about it too much anymore. I, I figured if the government was going to do something to me, it would have happened. You know, when this case was going on, I don't think I'm really much of a threat to it anymore. Now that I I lost my uh, congressional campaign, you know, if I would have won that, I probably would have felt a bit uneasy too. But I didn't, so I don't, I don't think the government has much care for me at this point. And you haven't received any uh, negative feedback from you know from your testimony and stuff, and from your your. Sure, I have. Sure, I have, because there's a lot of people that don't want to believe it that think maybe I have an alternative agenda to get my name out there. To, you know, there are people saying I wanted to run for office back in. Uh, 2008, 9, 10, whatever year. I did run for office in 2012, but I only ran because the district lines were redrawn in Michigan. And, and before that time, we I was in the district with John Dingle, who's been in office 56 years and has never lost an election. So I would have never considered running against him. Uh, U.S. Congress is the only political office I've ever been interested in. So that those were lies too, saying I was doing it for a political run, not true. Doing it to make money, not true. I've never made a penny off the story. Doing it to write a book deal, to get a book deal, not true. I don't have a book deal, never sought one. Uh, doing it to boost the business at my law office, not true. My business has not gone up from this, you know. For every client I gain, there's another one I lose saying I'm anti-American or anti-government, that kind of thing, so... Uh, I think you should. You know, I think somebody should offer you a book deal to be quite, and not not one of these big publishers. If anything, maybe like Chris, uh, Chris over at Trine Day or something. I mean, honestly, why not get the, the the truth out to the public? And if someone says, "Oh, you know, well, he, you know, he's a good profit or whatever," first of all, first of all, did you do two thousand hours of investigation? No, Kurt did. Okay, so did you pay him for that? No. Okay, would you know any of the story? If if Kurt didn't have the balls to come out and do you know say any of this and then go do the investigation, no, you wouldn't. So stop whining. If he writes a book, I'll not only you know parade him around on my shoulders, but I'll promote it and you know I'll tell everybody to buy it. I I think he. I, in fact, to be quite honest with you, Kurt, I was going to tell you to write a book. Uh, during the break when we were chatting, it was something that popped into my head. I was like, maybe you meet, you know, perhaps tell Kurt to contact uh, Chris over at Trine Day or have Chris contact him. People should know what what you went through and what you witnessed. And anybody that ha- says, Ooh, or tries to poo-poo that, well, then you're a fool. Because at the end of the day, he's trying to give out information. And to block that on any basis is just ignorant. Yeah, you know, well, maybe at this point I I would consider it, but my point of doing all this has never been for anything except to, well, two reasons. The first, the first re- well, my initial reason was to help catch a, an accomplice to a terrorist attack, but then my next goal was to find out why this happened. This was a very traumatic event for myself and my family. You know, I had many, many months of sleep sleepless nights over this wondering what really happened. Um, and then my ultimate goal became to tell the American public what its government had really done in this case. So my goal has never been anything besides that. But maybe at this point I would consider writing a book someday. But um, you know, I, I haven't really thought about it a lot because that's never been my goal. 
but yeah, maybe well, I wouldn't at some point. Take it from me. You, 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 you can you can say it was my suggestion if any, if you want to blame anybody. <laughs> I, I think you should. I, I think if anybody, you know, if Trine Day or anything, anybody that would let you speak truth, not one of these places that would buy your book and then put it in the shelf and never publish it. You know, one of these, you know, the, like Trine Day publishes a lot of stuff about the JFK assassination. So they would be, you know, one of the first ones I would go, for, you know, if I were <clears throat> in your situation and I eventually wanted to write a book, that's where, the way I would go. But I recommend that you do it. And if you want to blame anybody, you can blame me. Because, I mean, people people need to know what you witnessed, dude. They really do. And honestly, it, it, as a way of uh, kind of an extra safety net, the more people that know about the story, the less likely bad things are that you know likely to happen to you. Because the more spotlight that's on you, and obviously there was such a big spotlight on you, that's you know one of the reasons why you'll. I, I doubt anything bad would happen to you, uh, unless of course, like you said, your congressional run, uh, which we're going to get into. Because uh, we're going to break uh, in a few minutes, but on the other side of the break in the the final segment, I want to get into your congressional run. And I, maybe, perhaps, if you had gotten in Congress, you probably w- uh, well, not probably. I'm sure you probably would have pissed in someone's cornflakes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's safe to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's safe to say that you you probably would have been, uh, uh, you know, not a team player, as they say. It was. You know, I, we can get into details on the other side, but we got a few minutes. So, like, out of your congressional run, I, I, in a nutshell, if you could take, if you could say you took one thing away, and we can get, like I said, further into detail on the other side. But if you could, you know, in a in a nutshell, if, if you took one major thing, learning experience away from this congressional run, what was it? Uh, the biggest thing I would say I took out of it is that. The big parties, and I ran, ran as a Democrat, um, Republicans and Democrats, I thought if you won the nomination for your party, the party would come out and back you 100%. And I found out that that wasn't true. You actually have to be, you know, one of their so-called chosen people or in tight with the uh, people that pull the purse strings of the party, or otherwise you'll just be shunned by the party and that's what i was i wasn't given any support by the democratic party hardly at all elite well let me take that back on the state and federal level actually they worked against me i was given quite a bit of support on the county level so but at the state and federal level i thought once i won the primary you know i would have funding and support from from those and i i didn't and i um you know, I, I expected I would, and I thought that's how things worked. But I, I think that's a good lesson learned. And you don't have any plans, obviously, for running again in the future, correct? No, you know, I look at 2012, which was the year I, you know, I did most of my campaign. It's kind of a lost year in my life. I spent almost a whole year campaigning. You know, I put about a couple thousand hours into that, too, campaigning. I put a lot of my own money into it. And I did win the primary, but I lost the general election by 10%. So I was pretty disappointed that I lost by that much. But I look at all the fun things I lost out on last year, all the time with my family, all the money I spent, and... All the negativity, too, it's really disgusting. All the people that hate you, even though they never met you, even though they don't know anything about you except you're running for, you know, this office by such and such party or an evil person or whatever. And, you know, I don't need the negativity. I, all I wanted was to bring some openness and honesty to the, to the federal government at the federal government level. And I have all these people attacking me saying I'm un-American, you know, um, I don't really support the United States, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that I have some alternative agenda. I'm really, you know, a spy for the Republican Party. I'm not really a Democrat. I don't really have Democratic views. And, you know, I'm here I am trying to make this country a better place, in my opinion. You have had all these people attacking me, spent a lot of my own money, got very little financial contributions from anyone, you know, I, I would think at least people uh, would not want 
well, many people should not have wanted Tim Wahlberg, Wahlberg back in, which is who I ran against. He's very um, extremely far to the right. So at least I would have thought people to the left or moderates would have been happy to support me, but they didn't. You know, instead I'm called a conspiracy theorist and a nut and these kind of things. And you no, know, I don't really have a desire to do it again. To me, um, this country is not ready for honesty. They're not ready for honest politicians. They're more than happy to keep the same people in office, the same dishonest career politicians. And uh, they're not ready to be told the truth. And, and I don't think they will be in what's a major event happening in this country. So. Just a, uh, another lesson I learned, you know, from my campaign last year. And, and you know, we were talking off air about this. It's you know, the system really isn't. It, a lot of people say, "Oh, the system's broken." The system's not broke. It's not just not set up in our favor from the beginning. So once you realize that the the game isn't isn't what you think it is, uh, and then things become uh, very different. You start to see the world in a different light, so to say. And yeah, uh, you know, I, this was a kind of another awakening I had, much more minor compared to the underwear bomber. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off right there. Okay. Make you hold that thought because we got the brake sneaking up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. Final half hour coming up with tonight's guest, Kurt Haskell. I'm telling you, time just goes right by like that on this broadcast. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Final segment. And don't forget that Monday through Friday after Joe and I get off air. Well, uh, actually, now it's Monday through Friday, even when I'm not live Monday, Wednesday and Fridays on Tuesdays and Thursdays. If I don't hop on to do a live broadcast, my uh, rebroads are on. So uh, Monday through Friday, after you hear my lovely voice sign off at midnight, don't go anywhere because now from midnight to two and possibly even a third hour down the road who knows but at least from midnight to two my buddy ryan brooks is on so make sure you tune in for the sound of freedom and by the way i want to plug something really quick i promised somebody i would plug something before i i forget and uh, uh otherwise my brain will spin off uh patriotspot.wall.fm patriotspot.wall.fm it's like a little um social networking uh site for people that are like-minded if you want to like meet people in your area or whatever locals or even people across the country whatever make friends with them get to know one another maybe share ideas get out there get involved do whatever uh do your thing he he's a listener and he's put it together and it's all for free so go check it out patriotspot.wall.fm uh it's a pretty good site uh, i i thought it was pretty cool and uh, the guy did a lot of work on it. So show him some support. Show him some love. All right, Kurt, uh, finishing up with your your congressional run, and then I want to pick your noodle on a few other topics. Uh, but finishing up with your, your congressional run here, would you recommend anybody try to run for Congress right now uh, until we can straighten anything out? I mean, uh, I guess people are going to say it's biased, but you went through the ringer. So, I mean, you've gone yeah. through this. So would you recommend anybody go for it or no? You have to be politically connected. So, it, I guess if you have the connections, but then if you have the connections, are you really the kind of person who want an office and need an office? So, and I think the answer would be no to be that politically connected. So, uh, I, the right people, I don't think, have a chance of winning. Unless you have multi-million dollars of your own to fund your own campaign, but even then you might not win. Yeah, just just an example of what I went through. I haven't mentioned this, but when I declared I was going to run, by the way, I only decided I was going to run because the district lines were changed and I was taken out of John Dingle's district in early 2012. And my county, Monroe County, was put in the Tim Wahlberg's district. I went from someone who is impossible to beat to someone who I consider to be very vulnerable, who had only won the last election by 3%, and he lost the 2008 election by 1%. So it's a very close district between Republicans and Democrats. The numbers are all, almost evenly split. Um, but when I declared, I was the only Democrat that had declared. And I declared late. It was March 3rd when I jumped into this race, and you only had until the first week of May to jump in. 
And I was the only Democrat running. And instead of supporting me, the state Democratic Party recruited Joe Schwartz. Now, Joe Schwartz is a former Congress, former Republican congressman. Remember, I'm running as a Democrat who lived out of the district. The Demo- state Democratic Party asked Joe Schwartz to switch parties, move into the district and run against me on the Democratic ticket in the primary. Now, Joe Schwartz went back and forth on this for about two months, trying to decide if he was going to do this. We only had two months and one week to get into the election, one week before the deadline to declare Joe Schwartz said, I'm not running. So again, that left me as the only Democrat on the ticket. What does the Democratic Party do at this time? Support me? No. The Democratic Party recruits Ruben Marquez to run against me. And there's a requirement in Michigan that you have to have 1,000 signatures minimum of registered voters in your district. Well, Ruben Marquez at this time only had one week to get all the signatures, which is impossible to do it by yourself. It takes about, on average, uh, you can get about five or six an hour, I found, when I went out and got my signatures. So there weren't enough, wasn't enough time for Ruben to do it on his own. So what does the Democratic Party do? It gets... Uh, the state Democratic Party recruits members to get all Ruben Marquez's signatures for him and does it for him to get him on the ballot in the last week to run against me. And he turned in his signatures an hour and a half before the deadline on the last day. So now I had to spend, uh, I think I spent about $25,000 of my own money to defeat him in the primary, which I could have used in the general election to defeat the Republican. But it just shows you that even though I was running as a Democrat, the Democratic Party was against me because it knew that I was so outspoken in the underwear bomber case and that I would be the same way if I got to Washington, not speaking out against the Democratic Party, which I've never done, but speaking out against corruption in government, as I have always done, or at least during the underwear bomber case. That's what I was concerned about not electing a a Democrat, but having an honest politician in Washington was what the Democratic Party was concerned about. So I didn't realize it was so corrupt before I got into this, but it is. So maybe, uh, maybe I was wrong in thinking that once I won the primary and was the only Democrat on the ticket against an extreme right wing Republican, that the Democratic Party would then come out and support me and give me funding or whatever. It, it still it didn't do so. As a matter of fact, the head of the Michigan Democratic Party never talked to me for one second after I won the primary. I called him many, many times. He refused to talk to me, refused to support me, refused to do anything for me. And the uh, National Democratic Party never contacted me once before the primary or after. So it just goes to show you you know, how corrupt politics really are. You have to be in on the game to have the support of people higher up in the party. And even though, you know, I was in a very winnable district, very split district with nearly no challengers, the Democratic Party still would not support me. So people that are considering running for office and want to be an honest politician, you really need to think twice about it. It's something that I learned. So basically, you know, I... I, w- I did have the support of many unions, and I did have the support of the county parties and the people in the Democratic Party, but the people that controlled the purse strings, the real power people, would not support me, which is very interesting. Well, and that just goes to show you that it's, you know, it's not one side or the other side. It's both sides that lie, and it's all a, it's all a big joke because they look what I thought it was. Honestly, I didn't even realize that the Democrats had done that to their own people. I knew that the, the Republicans had done it uh, time and time again. You know, this election cycle, they had not only screwed the Ron Paul campaign, but they had gone uh, and screwed over a lot of other uh, like independent or uh, grassroots type, uh, you know, quote unquote conservatives that were running. So uh, it's interesting to show that here you have a case of the, the Democratic Party doing the same thing and screwing over one of their quote unquote own who was running and they totally threw you under the bus. Totally. They totally did. This was a very, very winnable election. It was won by a Democrat in 2010 and the Republican. Uh, one in, uh, I'm sorry, was won by a Republican in 2008, 
and the Republicans won the seat in 2010 only by 3%. So it was a very winnable seat for a Democrat with an unpopular Republican who is not in office, um, who is only in a second term, having uh, two non-consecutive terms. He won, then he lost, then he won. Uh, not a very popular guy, yet the Democratic Party gave me no financial support, and it wouldn't even come out and endorse me. I mean, it's ridiculous with an extreme right wing, right wing Republican as my opponent. So it just goes to show you that the Democratic Party here in Michigan, at least, does not want to elect Democrats. It wants to elect uh, corrupt Democrats, people that will go along with the corruption within the party. I didn't know that before I ran, but I do know it now. You should title your book The Awakening of Kurt Haskell. <laughs> or something. Multiple awakenings. Right? Multiple, uh, yeah. Uh, on multiple different levels. So yeah. are do you look at things completely differently now? When you look at the news, do you say, no, that's a lie, that's garbage? I don't even watch the news on TV anymore because nearly all of it is a complete lie. So, yeah, I look at it completely different. I get all of my news online now because... To me, the mainstream media news is nothing but government propaganda. It pretty much is. I mean, they don't even argue. They 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 don't even argue with these politicians unless they they t they're not towing the party line or they question things. Uh, you know, I just I, I briefly caught uh, Soledad O'Brien and others on CNN chat and MSNBC chastising. Uh, the uh, I guess it was the senators that were go, uh, ripping Hillary Clinton, and they were chastising them for, uh, you know, questioning her and being harsh on her. And it was like, really? Well, what does she have a halo and wings and fly around? You know, I, I don't see. You know, she's not an angel. She's a human being, and she's responsible. She's the Secretary of State. But it's just, it's amazing how they, it, it, when they roll it out, we, especially if you're awake. If you're asleep, you probably you don't see it. You buy into it. I mean, I I did at one point. I I voted for Bush back in 2000. And I even voted for him again in 2004. I could tell you, I got disillusioned like within weeks. I even said I regret voting for this dick. My my exact words. I really did. I I, I really regretted voting for him the second time. And then I I it's when I started to look into him more. And I woke up and. By the time the next election came around, I was I was awake. But I had, you know, it took. Look, everybody, you know, everybody has their own path of awakening. But it's interesting how yours was rather um, large. I guess you could say. Yeah. Abrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A yeah. slap in the face. Yeah. Yeah. It was so very when, shocking. Very shocking to me how all all this went down. So when you look at stuff now, okay, when you look at current events, and I got a, 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 a question in the chat about this, so I have to ask you this. Okay. But uh, when you look at current events, okay, let's, let's look at the Sandy Hook shooting. There's a lot of people that say, hey, it's not what happened. It's not you know, what the government says or what the authorities say happened. And mm -hmm. I, there are, a, a, at least in my eyes, there is a ton of red flags but, uh, mm -hmm. and things that need to be at least looked at. I, I, I'm not sure yet, but what's your thoughts? I mean, do you look at things like that now and go, wow, that could, there could be a possibility that that, you know, might be something strange or do you, or do you still, nah, I'm not sure. Well, you know, I've had the play, the playbook shown to me. I know, I know all the plays. So when I, when I see things now after the underwear bomber case, I look for evidence of the place from the playbook. And though, these, are, these are the plays. Other people involved that the government doesn't want to talk about. Video that won't be released. Contradictory evidence very early on. Um, media, uh, the case being bombarded by the media to further a government policy of some sort, government action to enact that policy shortly thereafter. Okay, if you have all of those, you have a false flag event. Now, when I apply those to Sandy Hook, second man arrested or third, I think there was a guy arrested in the woods, another guy laying in the park while with handcuffs on, okay? Video from the school admitted to exist, not released. Um, Multiple conflicting reports early on about the principal dying, not dying. Um, 
different things. You know, I, I'm not an expert on the case, but there are different things that were contradictory. Um, a clear push by the media for gun control immediately thereafter proposed legis legislation in Congress and an executive order by the president trying to enact that policy. I, I think I hit all the points there. Um, Sandy Hook is a false flag event. What the truth is, don't know. You know, and I may look stupid if I try and guess, but um, show me the evidence. Show me the video. Show me the bullet holes in the school wall. Show me anything other than the government telling me this is what happened. Because you know what? I know firsthand the government is not trust trustworthy, and the government stages events. Now, I'm not saying people died. There's a real, very real possibility that nobody died at Sandy Hook. Because you know what? The underwear bomber case, too, was set up so that nobody would die. But people would think it was a legitimate threat. And I could easily see the case where Sandy Hook was insane. I don't know if that's what happened. But all the, all the plays from the playbook that I've been taught are there. So... I don't know. One thing that really concerns me about Sandy Hook, though, is the FEMA uh, event that was scheduled for the exact day, time, and location um, near Sandy Hook. And the event, which I think you can still see on the State of Connecticut website, was a large FEMA training event to train workers how to deal with masses of traumatized children. And to me, that screams red flag so sorry you can call me crazy or whatever you want sandy hook is a false flag event i don't know what the truth is but the truth is not what we're being told well you know i respect your opinion on it and i it's actually an interesting take because again you have a, a perspective that myself and not many others really do you know you've lived through one of these events where you actually watch the government uh or you know through uh, what you witnessed and then being, you know, told, no, that's not what happened and what you went through afterwards and everything. You actually watched how the government lied and changed the story and tried to cover things up and manipulate things and, you know, change the narrative. So you actually witnessed a false flag event. So, you know, it's, I mean, I could read about it and I could talk to you about it, but you yourself have that firsthand experience and, you know, for you to be able to look at something like this and say, well, look, you know, point one, point two, point three, point four, and it bing, 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 bing. I mean, I, I don't think anybody, I, people could call you crazy. They could call you whatever names they want. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you didn't say anything definitive anyway, what happened, but that you, that's a really good point. I mean, I don't have that perspective of having lived through a false flag event myself. You do. So that's why I'm glad that you gave me your perspective on that. Right. That's like, you know, that's, you know, what many of your listeners, I'm sure, are saying right now. Well, you know, Kurt may be credible or not, may have his own agenda, whatever you want to say for not believing me. But I can't say that because I lived through one. I investigated one. I know what I saw, how the government lied about it, twisted the truth. And I saw, like I said, I saw its playbook and how it conducted conducts itself in these sort of investigations and how can i say when there's a subsequent event with all these same characteristics that it's anything but what i was involved in which is a false flag and the answer is i can't and i need some hard evidence to show me otherwise and there is none the only evidence is this um, that something took place in sandy hook but there's no proof anyone died. There's no proof any bullets were fired. All there is is statements by people connected to the government telling us what happened and some very questionable people making statements about it afterward and a clear motive for the shooting, which is to uh, restrict the Second Amendment, which was clearly pushed in the aftermath of this event. So... To me, they're, they're one and the same type of event. So how can I make a different conclusion with this one with no evidence whatsoever, in my opinion? And the answer is I can't. 
Well said. I, it, I mean, again, I don't have your perspective. I mean, I, I just, I, I could try to have your perspective on things, but y- you, Ed, if anybody has you know, that perspective of you've lived through it and you've witnessed it, and if your alarm bells are going off, then, I mean, look, at the very least, I, I think people should investigate it. Uh, myself, I haven't gotten a chance to tear a lot of things apart. I keep, uh, what I keep doing is I keep breaking off small chunks of it uh, when I have a spare, when I have the spare time. And I go through it, and I make little notes here and there. And there's a lot of red flags about that case. I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, my biggest red flag is how'd the kid get into school? Because, you know, supposedly if he had the AR-15, it would have been visible. And then how'd he get into school? Why would you buzz somebody in with an AR-15? Well, he shot his way through. Really? How many magazines did he go through before he got through the door? Because I know that thirty round mags, they're not gonna, you know, two two three is not gonna. It, 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 uh, people don't realize that that doesn't really have that penetrating power that you think that a lot of people think it does. It's a two two three is a glorified twenty two. Okay, Re- that's really what it is when when you cut it down to the brass tacks. And it's not gonna unless the kid had like a couple drum magazines and the thing was fully automatic. It's not like in the movies. It's a semi-auto, one shot, one you know, squeeze. So it just it, it it doesn't make any sense. And then you find out that the what about the gun being left in the car, and that he only used. There's a news report from MSNBC. It's right on their website. It's still there. You can go see it. It was from the next day, and they said that he only used four pistols, and that the gun with the long rifle, the the AR, was found inside the car. Well, what about that? You know, and it's amazing how I look at it. So far, my take on it, and I haven't looked into the the fakery part of it or whatever yet. I've, I've looked into it a little bit, but my take on it is even if this is a, a tragic event that actually did occur, the actual event that occurred is not what we're being told, and they're twisting the narrative to fit their agenda, and it doesn't matter that they're literally, as Ben Shapiro from Breitbart said, standing on the bodies of dead children to to do what they have to do. Whether they be real kids or fictional doesn't matter. They're you know, they're playing that emotional heartstring, you know. It's the appeal to emotion so that they can come on, they can shame people into giving up their guns and everything else. Uh, I it, whether or not the, the the event itself was even staged or not, it, you can see the response to it is very contrived and the and and the the narrative is being twisted so i think people should look into it and Kurt, i really appreciate your you know you giving me your candid uh you know thoughts on sandy hook some people th- find it taboo to to bring sandy hook up you know they don't want to get labeled a conspiracy theorist or anything well you know i've been called much worse throughout this whole thing you know especially early on in the underwear bomber case i was called crazy but you know what the facts played out and they showed that I was right and that I was the only one actually being honest. And you know what? I think more of this will come out on Sandy Hook shooting at some point, maybe many years in the future. But, you know, I, I think what really, um, what do I want to say? But, you know, I'm not even convinced anyone was even shot at Sandy Hook with the steam event being scheduled the same day, the same time, the same place. Isn't it just as logical? You, well, you, 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 you never know. I have to cut us off right there because we're about to get cut off in like 10 seconds. Kurt, don't go anywhere. I'll say goodbye to you off air. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. Epic broadcast. I'm going to have to have Kurt back on to pick his brain even deeper. Don't go anywhere. Ryan Brooks is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of here.